As Leslie mentioned, this presentation is in fact based on the work that I did for my dissertation around I went to Georgia Tech. And at that time, which was somewhere back in the sort of 90s, we don't have to get too much detail about that, um, there was a lot of buzz in the business press around collaboration. People were beginning to talk about the importance of collaboration and interaction in the workplace. And you saw books written like uh, The Wisdom of Teams and Good to Great and uh, Group Work and Working Groups. And all of these books and articles all talked about the importance of interaction and collaboration in the workplace. I mean, we sort of accept it as a, as a common thing today, but it was pretty novel back then. And what I noticed was that a lot of architects and designers would go to owners or potential owners of buildings and go, oh, this building we're designing for you is going to be really collaborative. Right? It's going to be really interactive. And my question was, well, how do you know that? What are you doing in that building that actually is going to have any outcomes on collaboration whatsoever? The answer that we usually got back was, oh, it has an atrium. Right? <laughs> or it has uh, you know, the coffee bars. And then, of course, it, it, in the 2000s, with the whole Googleization of space, it was, well, it's got foosball tables, and it's got ping pong tables, and we're going to put soft seating and bean bags in. You know, the whole thing you can imagine. Well, my thought to that was, well, maybe, maybe those do have some effect on collaboration, maybe they don't. But if we're going to go out and tell people we're going to create a collaborative environment, we should have something to back it up. So I started doing some research on trying to understand, first off, what is collaboration? Why is it important in the organization? Why do we care about it? What's the kind of collaboration that's most important? And then finally, the big question for us in the design community is what can we do as designers that will have any impact on collaboration? So that's what this uh, presentation's about. The MIA's Margaret, please feel free to speak up. I don't like to wait till the end. If you got a question or a comment, please feel free to speak up. So let's get started. Now, when you do research on something like uh, collaboration when you're in school, the first thing you have to do is establish the fact that collaboration is worthwhile to study, which was not that hard to do because at that time, and even more so since then, there's been plenty of good research that demonstrates the effectiveness and the importance of collaboration in the workplace, right? And what we know is that organizations that consistently perform better than other organizations tend to uh, identify high levels of collaboration, particularly between lots of different people in the organization, lots of different teams, as a critical a success factor for their importance. But what we found when we started looking at collaboration was that that's a pretty big term. Right? Collaboration, I mean, technically, it's a little one-sided, but it's what we're doing right here. You know, when y'all were sitting over the table, you were actually collaborating. It was more social. You read a company email, you go to a meeting, you attend a conference, you're on a conference call. All of these things are forms of collaboration. But it turns out that there's one kind of collaboration more than any other kind that's probably most closely associated with high performance in the workplace, and that is the collaboration that we call informal interaction. Now, you know important interactions, those, those quick, unscheduled, face-to-face -face things that happen all day long as we move around the organization. Usually between two people, sometimes three. They're usually short, uh, and they're always unscheduled, informal interactions. You hear them call the water cooler moment, the bump in, the collision, the serendipitous encounter. I mean, they've got lots of different names, right? Uh, but it turns out that these are very important for us to study for a couple of reasons. First is they're the most common type of collaboration in the workplace. Um, secondly, they are uh, one that seems to be the most tied to effectiveness and performance when we talk to organizations and do the actual measurements on performance. But the third one, and probably the one that's most important to us, it's the one that we can affect through design. Scheduled formal interactions, we can't have a lot of effect on the frequency and the location of them. In other words, this is a scheduled formal interaction right here. You came here because that's what was on the invitation. If this afternoon you got a note saying, hey, it's been moved to the Holiday Inn across the street, you would have gone there, right? Well, maybe not to the Holiday Inn across the street. But <laughs> <laughs> the point is, uh, the schedule them interactions, you go there because that's where the event is. Informal interaction, on the other hand, is very, very sensitive to space. In fact, what I'm going to demonstrate to you tonight is that the way space is arranged is so powerful, it not only affects where informal interaction happens, you can actually predict the location and the frequency of informal interaction just based on the way you lay out space. I'm going to show you that. Okay. 
Now, oftentimes people ask, well, why, why is informal interaction so important? Why is it so uh, uh, necessary in a healthy organization? And there's lots of reasons. I mean, one of them is the sort of romantic notion of innovation. You know, I run into you in the break room, we start talking, and we invent Velcro, or Post-it notes, or Viagra, or whatever it is we're inventing, right? And that is that romantic notion of it. And, and it's true that that happens, but it turns out that informal interaction is also very important for lots of other sort of more mundane reasons, right? Just getting work done, solving problems, you know, keeping the machine moving. Also for social reasons, getting to know each other. You know, we like to work with people that we know something about, that we know better. In fact, if someone new comes to your organization, you may say, gosh, she's kind of weird. And you go, oh, you know what, but I used to work with him last year. He's actually okay with you. Right? This is just a, this is a coping a social mechanism. It just comes from our human experience, you know, where we have to sort of form a kinship with groups. There's also the notion of enculturation. How am I supposed to behave in this company? How do I act? Is it okay for me to go plop at the boss, boss's desk, or do I have to make an appointment to do a secretary? Right? How do people talk to each other? You know, how do they behave? You know, you can actually go and um, have a meeting like this and sit down and say, okay, new employees, here's what we expect from you. You know, here's how you behave. Here's the quality of work we want from you. But it's much more sort of robust and natural for people to be able to move around and sort of see that for themselves. Things like employee oversight, inspiration. There's lots of reasons that we want to support a lot of movement and encounter that's related to informal interaction in the workplace. Now, one of the biggest myths about informal interaction is where it happens, right? And I know that all the myths are like, you know, people are in the hallway and they're running into each other and they're in the break room and the water cooler moment, or these groovy spaces we make with the ping pong tables and the beanbag chairs, right? And then people sort of think that's where informal interaction happens. So we spend a lot of time creating all these little groovy spaces on our floor. But the truth of the matter is nobody says, hey, Sonia, let's go down to the informal interaction space. <laughs> that's in fact not the way it happens at all. And what we know is that 70%, and I will tell you that in R&D facilities, like big pharma, laboratory development, as much as 90% of all informal interaction happens right there at somebody's desk or the opening to their uh, office, if they're in an office, or if two or three people are working in a conference room space and somebody walks by right there, right? We call this the doorway moment, sort of the drop-in, the drive-by, whatever you want to call it. This is where informal interaction happens mostly. And a lot of it really has to do with the fact that we are very tied to our resources. I mean, you and I can stop and talk in the hallway for a few minutes, but eventually one of us is going to say, well, come back to my desk and I'll show you what I'm talking about. Or I've got the papers at my desk, I'll meet you in the conference room in 30 minutes or whatever. Right? That's how most informal interaction is. Sometimes it doesn't. Sometimes you just say, okay, I'll talk to you later until I see you. But in the workplace, quite often you end up going to someone's desk because we're tied to our resources, which for most of us right now is our computer screen or maybe some documents. Now there may be a time in the future, right, where we don't have to tie to our computer screen. We can just walk to the wall and I touch the wall and count the screen comes out or displays on my clothing or in midday, or who knows what's, what's around the corner. But right now, we're all pretty heavily reliant on stuff at our desk, especially the computer screen, right? Now, if you think about this, if you might ask yourself, what are the things about space that can help drive and support more of this natural interaction the way it happens anyway? And when we were at Tech, we looked at every variable you could think of. Not every, but we looked at about 50 variables. Does it have an atrium? Does it have escalators? How much glass is there? Is there a coffee bar? Uh, does ping pong, to be, if there's a ping pong table, does it make a difference? We looked at 50 different variables, more or less. And in the end, we only found three things that we can manipulate as designers that had any effect whatsoever on the frequency and the location of informal interaction. And those things were the layout of the corridor space, the aisles, the average distance between people's primary workstation or office, if they're in an office, and how much visibility there is as you're walking around. How many people can you make eye contact with in your congregation? These were the only three variables that had any correlation whatsoever to frequency and location of so what I'm going to share with you now is a little bit more detail about how to think about layout, visibility, 
and uh, trans excuse me, layout distance and visibility, and how you can change patterns of uh, the collaboration in the workplace. So let's start with layout. By the way, that's Herman Miller's headquarters. I don't know if any of y'all ever had an opportunity to visit our offices in Michigan, uh, but that's our headquarters there. So let's start with layout. Layout refers to the configuration of basically the corridors, the aisles, the, the, sort of the people's circulation. And to look at circulation, it's you have to understand that the more paths that we can make that are equally desirable, the more opportunities there are for people to move around and have interactions with new people. It's like if you're in New York City and you want to go from one place, let's say, for example, we have a showroom in Midtown, New York. We have another showroom down in South Okay, so if I want to go between those two showrooms in New York, every day I can go a different way without really going out of my way, right? Because it's a big grid. Every day I can see different things and different people. But I live in Atlanta, and if I want to go, say, visit my sister, who lives in Atlanta also, I've only got one or two ways to go. And if I get off that path and start going down other paths and stuff, I will never get to her house, right? Uh, so I got to go up Peachtree Street, turn up Peachtree Dunwoody, whatever Peachtree, and eventually I'm going to end up in her cul-de-sac. I'm not going to go in and out of every cul-de-sac on the way there, right? I take lots of different paths because I will never get to her house. And human beings are nothing if not efficient when it comes to movement, right? We're not going to go any more than we absolutely have to. So you can plan space that's more like New York, it's like a balanced grid and everyone has lots of equitable choices to move around. Or you can design plans that are like cities and have one or two main paths and then lots of just little sort of dead-end branches off of it. Those are not going to create collaboration. That's what we want to stay away from. And I know sometimes, especially I used to work for a design firm that did a lot of laboratory planning. And the thought for a while was you plan this big main street, right? the big main street, and everyone has to go on that main street to get from anywhere to anywhere else. And the idea was when people would bump into each other and have these magical conversations. But what we know from empirical research is that's not what happens, right? And what happens is that people become so focused on that path that the only people they ever really interact with is the people who they walk right past when they leave their little cul-de-sac to get on the path, and that's it. They never have opportunities to see what's going on. Now, I use a method called space syntax, which is a way of analyzing space and actually getting some metrics on uh, if you have two or three plans, which one might promote more important interaction? Space syntax is a theory and a method, and it was developed at the University of College London, the School of Architecture, and it was actually developed by urban planners who were trying to understand why some parts of London were so successful. And the stores did well, the restaurants did well, the office buildings got good rental rates, there was very low turnover of uh, rent, there was also very low crime. You know, the place had a vibe, right? But then other parts of London, not too far apart, might have the same restaurants, the same stores, you know, the same uh, Class A office buildings, but there was more crime. People didn't go there. Restaurants didn't do well. Stores didn't last. Um, and, and what they noticed when they started looking at the sort of the way the building, the streets were configured, was that in the streets that did parts of town that did really well, there was more of a balanced grid. Uh, the streets had more connections to each other. It was clear and obvious where you were going. You didn't accidentally end up in a dead end. Um, and there were, there were more choices to go. And the choices were all fairly equitable. Um, but the other parts of London that weren't doing as well, there might have been a main street and then lots of little streets off of it, but they ended in dead ends or you couldn't really see where you were going. Or sometimes, and this is probably happened to you, you come out at an intersection and you thought, that's weird, I thought I was going to be over there, but I actually went here, right? And what they found was that people are just sort of reluctant to sort of explore that, but they don't have a feeling of comfort. So you can use this method. Now, in London, they use this method to look, as I said, at the urban setting, but you can actually look at to look at the interior built environment. When I was in tech, we did, we looked at things like um, museums, zoos, uh, certainly office buildings, it's used a lot part of the healthcare, <coughs> retail, anywhere where people are free to move around. Now it's used quite a bit in retail because especially, um, you know, they're very interested in getting people to move around the whole store. They don't want people to just come in and go to one spot and get out, right? So they do the Ikea thing. When you you get all the creation you know, to get that out. Now the other people who use this are people who design casinos and they're doing exactly the opposite of they want people to get trapped in space. They want people to get into that casino and knock it out. And you know what the trips, right? You can't see daylight. You can't really see your path out. I'll tell you something else I do, which is sort of, I don't know 
know why the farmers want to get away with this. But you know those maps which says you are here? They purposefully oriented differently from the direction you're standing. So when you look at the map, it looks like the exit should be here, but the exit's really over there. All right? Because they're trying to get you to stay in the space, right? They're the Venus flytrap. Okay. Well, here's how space and dense works. Let me show you, because I think if I show it to you, it'll be a little bit more understandable. You take a plan. Now, this plan could be a city, it could be a campus, it could be a very, very large building, right? And these are departments and, and, and uh, large spaces. Or for our sake today, let's just say that this is a typical office building floor, and these are conference rooms and, a, and maybe a big giant break room and workstations. It doesn't really matter. This method doesn't care what it is. It doesn't really care how big it is. It's only looking at the linkages between paths. The way that it works is you draw the fewest and the longest lines that describe the space. Okay? So in this case, this would be the corridors, the aisles between workstations. Then there's a program that you can get that you can run these lines through and it returns some values. And I, I use a program called Ajax, A-J-A-X. It's freeware. You can get it online. If you Google space syntax and Ajax, it'll pop up as the very first thing. It's just a little application. You import a JPEG, a floor plan, and you draw the lines. And then you do the, the data analysis. And when you do, it returns a value between 0 and 1 for every line and every intersection, where 0, which is dark blue, that's like my sister's cul-de-sac. These are places, you can think of blue as frozen. Nobody's going to go back there unless they absolutely have to. It's not on the beaten path. You're not going to go back there uh, unless there's something so powerful that can overcome the natural uh, uh, disconnectedness of the space. And of course, what is that usually? In the Soft serve ice cream. Exactly. Yeah. Food. Exactly. <laughs> it's food. Some kind of food. Maybe coffee. You know, maybe the person who knows how to do the software, maybe the only spot in the building that has a cell phone signal, whatever. Something's got to be pretty darn powerful to get most people to move back there. All right? Now, on the other hand, you've got lines and intersections which are approaching a value of 1, which are lines and intersections, especially the red, orange, and yellow. All, all things being equal, these are the lines that are going to see the most traffic. So what you want to do in a plan is not have one or two strong red lines, which again used to be the planning sort of idea, but you want to have as many red, orange, and yellow lines as possible because that, what that means is that all those paths are equitable and it's easy for people to navigate and they have lots of choices. Right? Because one of the things that we've learned from using this method now for over 30 years is people are highly predictable. I mean, when we do these studies and we go back and look at where people actually do most of their walking, we find that almost 80% of the foot traffic, right, because our old 80-20 rule, 80% uh, of the foot traffic is going to fall on what we call the top 20% lines, which basically the red or general lines, right? And that's because they are the most efficient way to move around. And human beings are efficient. I mean, you think about any place where somebody's put nice sidewalks going like this, what do you see cut across every corner? Even if you have to go through all the bushes for God's sake, people are still going to cut that corner, right? Now, there's a couple things you can do with this. Let's say this is our building that we have. Well, you could say, well, look, I've got some people who really don't need to be in the thick of things. They really need to probably be isolated. They need to be away from sort of uh, all the activity. Well, this might be a pretty good place to put those people. Now, on the other hand, let's say you had somebody who had like attention deficit syndrome and they weren't in everybody's business and they couldn't focus, and, right? That, that would not probably be a very good place to put that person, right? But it would be a great place to put a social space. I mean, in other words, if, if a lot of action and crossing of people is going to happen there anywhere, take advantage of that and go ahead and put a high activity social space there, <coughs> right? Um, now, I don't use it that way, however, one of the ways that I use this program is to redesign the space to try and increase the number of routes and some other statistics. And fortunately, this program gives you some statistics so that when you run an analysis on different plans, you can actually compare the numbers. Excuse me. So let me show you the numbers. The numbers across the top are telling you that this plan has 15 paths and it has 23 intersections. Now, one of the things about that is what I have found over many, many years of doing this is if you don't have at least twice as many intersections as you do paths, in other words, this number is falling short of 30, which would have been a 2 to 1 ratio, you probably don't have a very plan. That's kind of just a, a, 
again, based on just doing this for a long time, if you don't have at least twice as many intersections as you do paths, it means you don't have a balanced grid, all right? The next number it's telling us is routes. Those are the number of distinct routes that are to move from any place to any other place. So for example, let's say you're on this green dot and you want to get to that red dot, right? Well, you can go that way, or you can go that way, or you can go that way, etc. right? And if you count every path from every dot to every other dot, every permutation, there's 56 different ways to move around. Now, what we found in research, particularly again, I'm talking most of corporate here, mostly corporate, but also it works in higher education facilities, certainly works in retail. The more distinct routes you can have that are of equitable nature and there's not some social reason that people don't use it, the more sort of collaboration and interaction there is among many people. And what I mean about it, there's not some sort of social taboo. Let's say that, that let's say that uh, somebody that nobody likes or the boss sits right there, then probably if you've got any other way to go, you're gonna go out of your way, you have to go that way, right? So we're assuming that all things are wonderful, right? Now, uh, now this next number is called turns, and turns is a measure of depth that comes from wayfinding. And I don't know if any of y'all ever do healthcare, but if you do, I'm sure you're familiar with wayfinding. It's a much bigger deal in healthcare than it is in more materials. But what we know from the wayfinding literature is that people don't like to turn off. If you've got to move down a path, especially if you aren't 100 percent sure where you're going, and you've got to turn more than four or five times, you're going, and your anxiety level is just going to go up. And if you don't have to go down that path again, you won't. I mean, here's a perfect example. Someone's giving you directions, right? And they go, they go to the industry and turn left. Then when you get to Burger King, turn right. Then when you get to the elementary school, turn left. And then when you get to where Sears used to be, turn right. You're like, well, <laughs> that's a big one in Atlanta, where Sears used to be. It hasn't been there for 20 years. People still say, go to where Sears used to be, right? But if you get to like four of them, that's it. You're going to go, whoa, that's too much for me to hold in my head. I'm already confused. I'm already lost, right? Um, and so what we know is that in floor plates, particularly in corporate settings, in the research I've done, when people have to turn more than about four or five times to get anywhere else in the space, they're not going to do it. They're not going to go explore. They're not going to see people. They're not going to feel like they're part of some brain. You know, they're they're going to be isolated in their own little world. And if people are trying to create not just a collaborative plan, but also, if people talk to you about recruitment and retention and engagement, all that kind of stuff, but one of the ways to sort of tackle that is to get people moving around and see what's going on and see other people and see what's happening in the organization. This is not just about collaboration. It's about general awareness of, of the people you work with, right? So, <coughs> excuse me, 3.28 is actually not that bad. If I can stay around 3-ish, I'm usually feel pretty comfortable. Um, and then uh, it spits out a number at the end called the mean score. And the mean score is just saying that uh, this whole plan really probably only about 30% of these lines are going to see most of the movement encounter. And that is not a good number. It's not. If I, I really try and get a number that's above about 50%, right? Now, to do that, let me just show you one way that I do this. I'm going to take the same sort of volume of space, more or less, and I am going to relay it out. And one of the things I'm going to do, I want you to look when I like show you this new plan, and I want someone to tell me what's the most important change that I've made on this plan. I've made two big changes, but one of them is really important. Longer lines. Longer lines, that's one, but there's another one that's even perimeter. perimeter, exactly. Being a perimeter circulation. One of the most important things that we can do if we want to create a more collaborative plan is eliminate dead ends. And when I see clients come to us and they've taken like a six pack or an eight pack of workstations and they push them up against that perimeter window and then they put in a huddle space and write collaboration on it and say they've created a collaborative plan, I say, no, you haven't. You've created cold a sec after cold a sec after cold a sec. And nobody's going to, on their way to the break, go down each one of those little cold secs and come right back out. Plus, you know the other thing it does, it starts to create a sense of hierarchy. Remember, you do the 10 one. We know this. The workstations that are at the work at the or the window definitely are considered prime real estate. And if you walk to the back of that cold sack, the two people who are sitting there, you go, what do you want? What do you do with your space? Well, it's not their space. It becomes their space. Also, from a long-term flexibility standpoint, it makes it very difficult for teams to move and expand when they're also landlocked. Now, a lot of times people will say to me, well, yeah, we've got these eight by eight workstations, and if I don't push them up against the perimeter, I'm not going to be able to get all the ones I need in and get my density. And here's what I say to them is give them seven by seven. 
I mean, one foot is not going to make that much difference in the quality of your work. Having three feet in the perimeter will change your culture, right? It's that important. It's that important. And for companies that can't do it, I say, well, at least every other row, leave out the back too, so you can at least have some back rooms. That's how important it is. All right, so let's look at the numbers. I run the analysis, and one thing you'll notice right off the bat is there's a lot more red, orange, and yellow. That's what you want. You want to create a lot more uh, uh, opportunities for people to move around, and they're going to do it on those lines. Let's look at the numbers. Excuse me. So before we had 15 paths and we had 23 intersections. Now in plan two, we have 15 paths and 41 intersections. Now why is this number important? Because it's not about more circulation, right? I'm not just adding corridors. I'm making the circulation better, right? The next number is, remember I said about two to one? And I said I wanted to be at at least 30 intersections for 15 paths, well I'm at 41, so I'm actually doing better, okay? Now let's look at the next number though. Remember the last one we had 56 ways to move around, see and be seen, 208. But just through space funding alone, I had bought a stick of furniture. <laughs> just through space funding alone, I have given this company four times as many ways for people to move around and have collaborations and see and be seen, right? And that's why when people come to me and say, we've created a, co a really collaborative plan, we've put in 10 huddle spaces and a coffee bar, it's like, that's fine, but where are they located on the plan is more important, right? Okay, now we've also decreased the depth to 1.78, which as I mentioned earlier, 3.28 wasn't that bad, but this is just a diagram. But now look at what happened. The algorithm is telling us now 62%, almost two thirds of the lines, are now desirable and we'll see a lot more opportunities for movement in a camera. <coughs> so let me share with you a real example because these are just diagrams. Hold on a second, I have to go back to the computer and do this. I just, I've got a ton of examples, but I like this one because, um, because the director of the floor was so vocal about how central he was to the whole floor. And of course, you know where he sat, right there. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and he, he called himself the heart of the floor about four times until I finally said, you know, you're the left toe of the floor. <laughs> Let me tell you about this particular project. This is a real project. This is a media um, search company in New York City. In fact, this is Broadway. This is like 18th or 17th. It's a city block. This is a big, big building, right? Now, a couple of things that happened to them, and the reason they came to us was because they had created a uh, sort of a, 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 a flexible <coughs> program for people who wanted to be mobile, and part of it was to increase density. And this was the lovely mobility center <laughs> that they had put in uh, without our help from a couple of years ago. And as you can imagine, it was not very successful. It's crowded. It's too tight. Plus, if you're mobile and you come in to work that day with your team, there's a very good chance that that's your team. So it just, that was really part of it. There was also some concerns that um, workstations were different sizes and there was not a lot of equity between those. The other big concern was, and this is the director said to me, was that these people don't seem to know what these people do and that these people sort of never work with these people. Well, I mean, if they don't have a PhD to figure that out, they're highly fractured. Highly, highly, highly fractured. And the other thing you can tell from this plan is, is these renovations were obviously done in stages. There wasn't a blanket approach to the space. So they asked us to look at it in terms of making the sort of mobile worker experience a little bit nicer and more efficient, but also creating a way that people can actually work with each other better. And of course, one of the questions was maybe if we put a giant collaboration center in the middle, that'll work. And I feel like I'm saying it again. I'm say it's going to have a collaboration center. Not to say that people don't do that, but those are normally scheduled formal things, or if you happen to be sitting in the break room. Um, okay, so I did the space syntax on it because I just wanted to get a baseline before we did another plan. And so a couple things you can see. I didn't even bother to put paths between these people because when they're sitting there, you can't get through here anymore. So let's look at a couple things that this is telling us. The first thing is it's telling us that there's 43 paths and 59 intersections. Remember my two to one ratio? Bingo. I mean, that is bad. I mean, that would have been an 86 to even start to be collaborative. Then for uh, 163 ways to move around. Now that sounds like a lot, but you know, this is a really big doorway, right? Look at the average depth, 5.09. That's an average of five turns between any two workstations. I would just, if you don't think that's a lot, when you go to work tomorrow, get in front of your desk, and go somewhere that requires you to take five turns. You're going to end up in a 
place she probably had never food. It's <laughs> probably why. And Margaret, that's just the average. That means that some people were having to turn, you have to turn seven or eight times. This is why these people were working, these people were working, these people. Besides that, can't see it, right? So as you might imagine, the integration score is 0.35, which means only about 35% of these lines are really going to see any movement in the count. Right? Now, but there's something else that's more that important that's going on with the color. Uh, First off, you can see that Mr. I'm part of the floor. <laughs> He's got almost the bluest dot. He's almost in the most segregated space on the floor. Uh, also, these people with all this blue down here, highly isolated. But let's look at what's happening with the red. Remember that I said that the red dot should be the most important social active spots on the floor. That's where you really want to make sure your program is aligned with the natural patterns of movement and encounter. That's a Janet was talking. Okay? There's nothing special about that spot, unless you have to be the janitor on stage. But there's nothing special about it. Imagine this people's money getting their work done. Yeah. So this is where, you forget about the numbers for a minute, you can just look at the overall alignment between the natural patterns of movement encounter and what uh, you program it from there. Right? Now, I forgot to mention this earlier, but if red and orange and yellow are going to see the most exposure to movement encounter, blue is going to see the least. Green is kind of neutral. Green is, I'm not overexposed, but I'm not isolated. So when I do a floor plan and I've got green around most of the workstations, that's a pretty good response for me. Now, another couple of things that are happening, because this is such a floor play, big floor play, and they want to put a data center in the middle, what happens off the time when you get a big core in a building is it sort of splits the floor in half. And when that's the case, you do want to put two very strong paths which both connect the side. But then you want to make sure that once you get to each side, you've got a fairly sort of equitable movement and movement pattern. So sort of two strong red lines and then everything that's kind of green would be ideal. So let's see. So we did a new plan for them. Uh, to some of, the, some of the stuff on the plan, the director we put right here, I will tell you that I personally argue for getting the director out further in the space, even putting the him here with the glass wall but we ended up here. Now there's a glass wall here and these workstations are a little lower. So at least as you walk by, you can sort of see some movement. You know that somebody's home, right? You're not running, you know, you, because but where it was before, there's no way you could ever, you could ever have seen if there was anyone home. Because that one little door, plus these two people were never going to want anybody home. Right? Uh, all the mobility is more spread around the perimeter, just really just to make it uh, a better chance that when you came in to sit down, you were actually close to where your team was. There was more equitability between the workstations, uh, and we put in the new data center, some other stuff going on. Okay, so you do the space syntax again, the fewest and longest lines that describe the space. You run it through the program, and it returns these values between zero, which is navy blue, all the way to red, which is one. Now, let's look at a couple of numbers. First off, there were 43 paths in the original. There's 48 here. Again, that's important because this isn't about just increasing circulation burden on the plate. It's about making it more um, uh, effective. But look at the number of intersections. We went from 59 to 106. Right? So now that's an indicator to me that this plan is probably going to create more collaboration because I've got is I'm approaching a balanced grid. That's what that's really telling me. Look at this. We went from 163 possible routes to 682. So what this is doing, and you can't, you know, you can lead a horse to water, you can't make a drink, right? But at least it's giving everybody lots more equitable sort of chances or opportunities or possibilities to move around that floor plan, experience new things and new people. Yes, sir? Okay, um, with this, I mean, you're comparing numbers of circulation and getting to a result that you find desirable. Mm -hmm. But looking at the actual numbers of what the floor plan held mm -hmm. before yeah. people-wise function right. spaces, is that compatible with what this design actually ended up with? Yes. In fact, let me just stress that you're asking about if we have the same head count, right? Mm -hmm. Or the same capacity, which is a better way to talk about it, because head count includes some mobility. Mm -hmm. I can just say personally for me, I would never show a client a plan that reduced the head count before. I would never do it. I mean, I've never had a client yet say, can you redesign this so we can get fewer people in? I've never, but I always, I mean, I will always get the same number of people, and generally, I'll get more. But, I mean, it also just looks like from briefly reviewing this, this company was going through some change management yeah. where the amount of private offices or built spaces mm -hmm. is less. You know, most clients yeah. automatically, as soon as you think about using the perimeter, right. it's more square footage right. to circulation. But yeah. Well, they did, you know, 
he started studying research scientists. And he was trying to figure out how they transfer knowledge to each other in the organization. He wrote this great book called Managing the Flow of Technology. And he didn't mean like cables when we talk about technology. He meant, I've got this scientific knowledge in my head. How do I impart that to my colleagues, right? Uh, he just retired from MIT, and he wrote a great book called, uh, it sort of sums up the whole, his, whole, uh, uh, his whole history of research called Architecture and Organization. If you've seen it, you know it's all about how architectural configurations uh, change the culture of an organization. But what he discovered when he started doing his research in the 70s, when he was following an R&D scientist, was uh, he started marking a uh, plan, uh, who talks to who, where they talk, what they talk about. And he also marked where they sat. And what he realized after collecting data for a while was that a pattern was emerging. That the probability that two people would actually form a kind of relationship, whether it was social or professional, asking for help, we work on this paper with me, they have had a problem with this project. The probability of that happening, if they sat more than 30 meters apart, which is about 100 feet, went down to nothing. In fact, it was a very, very strong exponential curve from the frequency of interaction and how far you sat. And the further you sat apart from each other, which is sort of x-axis, your number of iteration, I mean, uh, interaction. Yeah. Now, 30 meters is not very big. I mean, if that's you, let's say that that's an 8 by 8 or an 8 by 10 space, just you, it's the scale. It's kind of your little world, right? And what we know is that people just don't form, not only not only don't form a lot of relationships with people outside that boundary, but in most organizations, people get most of their phone calls, their informal interaction, and now even their email for people that sit in that little 30 meter bubble. Now, a lot of that has to do with the fact that you're working with people on a project, so you're probably sitting there with them and you're copying on the mail, right? It's kind of a chicken and an egg thing. But for designers, what's important to know is that distance affects collaboration. We know this is why we do proximity, don't worry, this stuff, right? But if you have a company that comes to you and says, look, I really want to create more collaboration. I want these people over here talking with these people, talking with these people. You know, yeah, one, one response is to put one big heart and hub in the middle. But, you know, I, my sort of research shows that a better thing is to put lots of small, highly desirable things in places that are a little bit out of the way. Uh, it would call the strategic inconvenience. Uh, again, they usually have uh, food or it's specifically self-serve ice cream. And what they do is they get people, they're powerful drivers, and they'll get people back there. I mean, my sort of theory is we should use the food truck approach in the workplace. Like you should never really know where the food's going to be from day to day. You should just sort of move around, right? And you have to go hunt for it. But the 30 meter rule is important. And, and if you have a client who wants to really create more collaboration, you know, one of the ways to do that is really look at where people are located and do those measurements and figure out what you can do to tie those people together. Now, the last one is visibility. And visibility is all about how many people you can see and make eye contact with, or at least even be aware of their presence as you're moving around in your organization or seated. This research actually was started uh, back in the 70s or 60s, really, by Robert Probst. Now, you may know that name, Robert Probst. He was a director of research at Herman Miller for many, many years. And back when he was designing Action Office, right, for his first product, and so, um, he made a real study of how much enclosure people need in order to still feel connected to the organization but be able to get their work done. Now, I will just tell you that Probst did not use words like privacy. He used enclosure. And the reason he did it was because privacy is a personal, emotional thing that differs for all of us. What's private to you is what's not, is not private to me. We can control privacy. What we can control is the amount of enclosure people have in order to get their job done. And if their job is primarily heads down autonomous and they don't need a lot of distraction, they probably need more enclosure. So I always encourage companies, especially if they're embarking on this going to a more open workplace, don't use words like privacy. Because the workplace is not about privacy. It's about getting work done. Now, if you need more enclosure so you're not distracted, that's fine. But be careful. Words like privacy are just big, big time bombs, right? Now, Probe sort of took Goldilocks approach and said, this is probably not enough enclosure for most people. Uh, but I think, again, it's just personal. I mean, I personally can sit right here and work all day long. It doesn't bother me at all. But other people need a little bit more closure around them. Uh, on the other hand, this is too much enclosure. Even back in the 60s, Preps recognized that this is cutting people off from the organization. And what he sort of suggested, and this is what AO Action Office was based on, was that most people need something sort of in front of them and maybe to one or two sides, depending on how much collaboration they need. And as you can see from his 
sketches, he tended to favor that 120 degree splay sort of configuration because he felt like it helped support that notion of being connected but also being enclosed. In fact, I'm going to show you right now, these are the very first, the very first early shots of Action Office from the 60s. And you'll notice that what Probst was really trying to do was balance this notion of getting work done with being part of sort of the uh, uh, sort of energy around you. Now, we, we probably don't sell a lot of high panels like this anymore. It's not something we would do. Although you can still buy everything on my screen if you're so interested. You <laughs> <laughs> see less money to do that. <laughs> <laughs> we just reintroduced it for our class. But no, the point is, you can see what the, he, they, he was really trying to create sort of a dynamic, energetic workplace that let people feel like they're part of what's going on, but then still sort of turn and, and get their work done without too much distraction. And I can tell you that this is not what Robert Probst had in mind. Right? In fact, before he died, he wrote an editorial in the New York Times that said, when I die, do not attribute this to me. <laughs> because he was scared. He was, everyone was calling the bottom of the cubicle. This is what he came up with. This is what it turned into. Right? There's no energy here. There's no visibility. There's no feeling like you belong to something greater than yourselves. There's no awareness of your colleagues. There's no energy. And in fact, you know, <laughs> this is what kills me about this particular picture, is what are these people doing? that these people aren't doing but this extra six inches of panel. They need to have a better job. <laughs> They're doing six inches more work every year. Uh, not to use the fact that it's on the But this is soulless. I mean, this is this is really not the kind of place anybody wants to work. I don't care how nice the finishes are, right? Um, and I think that's why you see so much of this going on in today's workplace. And just walk around here and look, you know, we, we've got beautiful examples right here. But this feeling of, you know, balancing uh, uh, the enclosure with connectedness and I just want to mention something really quickly about transparency because one of the things that um, we, when I did my research, we, we definitely found evidence for how transparency helps collaboration. But one of the things that we've learned over the last few years, especially as the emphasis has really shifted towards this notion of engagement, which is really just another way of saying recruitment and retention, that one of the key drivers of engagement that we can deal with in the workplace of design is making sure that people can see the people they work for see the people who work with them, see their leadership. This notion of sort of being aware of everybody around you is very powerful, especially for younger people. You know, um, there's a lot of organizations like Gallup and McKinsey in Boston and now people like Mount, uh, Monster and Glassdoor that do a lot of research on what, why are people engaged, why are people motivated, why are people, you know, like their companies and stuff. You know, they all answer, ask slightly different questions, but they're all going after the same thing. You know, what drives you to perform well in this organization? And what they find over and over again consistently is that money usually comes in fourth or fifth. What comes in first? Praise from the boss. What comes in second? Recognition by senior leadership. Do these folks even know who I am? Does anybody know I'm here? You know? The third one is the possibility that I'm going to get selected to participate in an important project. Well, when I hear those kind of results coming out of studies, it tells me that one of the things that we can do is provide a lot of transparency so people can see and be seen and become aware of each other. There's another important part about trans uh, transparency, and that is inspiration. You know, it's really important, especially for new people to the organization and young people to the organization, to be able to see the people that they work with, the people they admire, the people they came to work with, the people they want to be with, their mentors. You know, Martha Stewart, I'll tell you, whatever you think of her, her, she's got this going on. If you look at her office, she's got a beautiful office in New York. It's a big, big, big warehouse space. Everyone is an open office. She's got a glass office right smack dab in the middle, and it's glass on all four sides. No draperies, no frosted patterns on the glass, no fret, you know, no, when you touch the button and the walls go white, none of that mess, right? Everyone in that place, even if you're 21 years old and you graduated from college yesterday and it's your first job and you love Martha Stewart and you want to be working for her, <laughs> you don't go to work for someone like that, you don't like her. And you're sitting there and you're looking over there and you see Martha Stewart who you came to work for, let me tell you something, that is powerful, powerful stuff, right? And all the bean bag chairs and more are not going to be placed there. So that's why the transparency is so critical. When I go to companies and they tell me, well, you know, all the directors and the managers and the 
residents, the vice presidents, whatever there. You know, they want solid walls and doors because, you know, we don't want people seeing what we're doing. Well, first of all, what the hell are you doing in there? <laughs> <laughs> what are you doing? And secondly, oh, yes, you do. You know, I deal with company, I was dealing with a company recently that was having a problem with recruiting, and the, the senior leadership was saying, is there a way we can lay the floor out so we can get off the elevators and get to our offices and then get back and we can see us? And I was like, no. No, in fact, I could have jumped your office and smack down in the middle, so you even have to go to the bathroom. You can see it. Right? It's very, very important that people see the people that they want to work with and be like them. <coughs> so that, that's really not so much about collaboration, although that does help with collaboration. It's really about trust and inspiration and engagement. So now I'm going to mention one more thing, and this was not part of our research, but if I went back and did it over again, it would be. One of the things that we learned, of course, from the research is that most collaboration happens at someone's desk. One of the things we didn't look at is, is there a place for a second person to sit when you're there? Um, and what we found, because so much work happens at the desk, I think it's really important to have at every workstation a place for a person to sit, a second person to sit. I'm not talking about a mobile pad, okay? <coughs> They're too tall, you know, your knees are below your hips, right? <laughs> also, they're heavy to pull out, they're not really comfortable. And for me, I'm still sitting up above people when I'm at it. What you really want to do is you want to have a second seat every workstation for someone to sit. And here's a couple of reasons why, right? I come over and I stand at your desk, right? You don't have a place for me to sit, so I'm going to stand here and talk to you for a while. Well, first off, we're going to be a good three feet apart, at least, probably about this far, maybe a little bit further if I'm hanging over the pan. Well, not only can you hear me, but everyone around can hear me because my voice is carrying. Plus, more importantly than that, I'm talking down to you. And if I'm your sort of boss or something like that, this is very uncomfortable. Or, God forbid, you've got a cockpit workstation where you have to turn into the corner to see your computer and there's nowhere for me to sit. i got to stay in behind and talk down to you, which is even worse, right? But a couple of really cool things happen. As soon as I take a chair and pull up and sit next to you, because I'm not going to keep talking to you like this. <laughs>
So this happens to be a beautiful system that does it very well. That's the reason I like to show it. Uh, and you can use, this is another one. This is the new system by Eve Bahar. And it's got what's called the social chair. That's a little different. When you sit in the social chair, even if you lean over it, you're still, you're, you're, it is about a more social conversation. Whereas the last one is more like what you said. You're, you're sitting next to somebody and looking at your screen. This is more sort of conversational. I mean, you could still turn your monitor and all, but, but really, I don't care if it's a beach crate. <laughs> a place for a second person to sit is really important. And then, of course, I'm not in any way trying to say that work doesn't happen in all these other places we're making. I'm just saying that we have to be careful that we don't put so much emphasis on all these third places in the workplace, you know, whether, whatever you call them, codes, home rooms, whatever, that we don't forget about the richness of where most interaction happens. And it's true. We start talking, and you say, hey, you know what? Call Leslie, and let's see what she's got on this. We'll meet over in the blah, blah, blah. That's how a lot of those spaces get used. And they need to be visible. You need to be able to stand up and say, oh, look, no one's in the eighth floor space. Let's grab it for a while. Nobody wants to take all their computer and all their stuff and go hunt and peck for the room. Okay, so let's just summarize here. Here's what we know, and this is from research, and miracle research on collaboration patterns at the workplace. The first one is we know that informal interaction is a very, very strong driver of performance in the workplace. We know that there's 35 years of research on this. It's sort of a, it's a fait accompli, right? Or axiomatic, I should say. What we know from environmental design research is that the frequency and location of these informal interactions, and by the way, this is all summarized on my handout this morning here. The frequency and location of informal interactions is driven by at least these three variables. There may be other, but these three I know are for sure. The layout of the configuration of space, circulation primarily, the distance between people, the average distance between people, right? The greater it is, less chance you're going to move around and see and form any kind of relationship. And the third one is visibility, which is really the number of people that you can make eye contact with or at least be aware of as you move around your space. For all three of these, we have very strong positive correlations with higher numbers of um, interaction. And if you use the space syntax, we can actually not just talk about the frequency, we can actually show you. So if you want to try and use this information, these are some suggestions. If you want to increase opportunities for informal interaction, design your space to maximize the number of rounds. Right? Not one big giant strong path with a couple of cold insects on it. Think of New York, a big balanced grid. Minimize the number of turns. The more people have to turn, the less they're going to do it. Right? Increase transparency, especially not just for collaboration, but for inspiration. Right? This is a cool place where I work. I love seeing all this stuff. I'm excited about being here. As opposed to if I go down this great tunnel again, I'm going to just watch my wrist. <laughs> and then <laughs> providing a second space in every organization or office for people to work. I think this is just really, really, really critical. And if I could go back in time 20 years and do my research, I would actually mark down is there a second seat in the desk. We didn't do that. That happens often when we do research. Um, thanks.
and it's driving this need to have a place for a second person to sit at your desk. I mean, if you and I want to talk to something, Eric and I want to talk about something we're on, why would we sort of get our laptop and all of our junk and go around and try and find a room and get logged into the network, you know, even assuming you've got wireless or you have a laptop, why don't you just sit at your desk and You see? So, so I don't know if it's driving it the way people think it is. Now, tomorrow, mm -hmm. I'm doing a presentation at noon here, and it's called sort of the top ten trends. They're based on research. This is one of them. It's just one of them. You can bear short attention. But I'm going to talk about the nine other big findings that we have seen from not just workplace, but business research, ergonomic research, things like that. One of them is that uh, rooms that for three to four people that have a monitor or some sort of visual display of computer technology get used four times more often than rooms that sit in the same space that don't have technology. And that's because people are becoming just so dependent on I gotta show you what's on my screen. What good is it just for our students to sit in this room if I can't show you? You know, I, Margaret, I did find that interesting is because I went to a meeting yesterday. It was at a restaurant, and um, I looked in the back, and I'm like, it's in the middle of the afternoon. I'm like, I don't see anybody. I know. Where are they? And they had gone into their private dining area, and they had huge computer screens, and they had it up. And I'm thinking, who? You know, look at the restaurants now. They're even going. So if you're in a restaurant designer or thinking about that, that is a way for them to drive business is that they're looking now at having computer screens. I mean, this, good is, or bad. I mean, this, this is a high up so restaurant. This is a high up yeah. restaurant. It's not just your yeah. casual. I mean, you know, there are a lot of people who's like, woe is me, you know, everybody's on the computer, everyone's on the cell phone. My sister's like, oh, those kids are already always on the phone texting. I was like, Virginia, that's my sister. So do you remember 30 years ago, mom and dad would play that we were always on the telephone, mm -hmm. on the party line, <laughs> out the den. It's like, it's the same thing. It's not going to change. That, well, that, that train is left the station. <laughs> it's just the way that it is. We're not going back, you know. And when people say, well, I like the way it was, I'm like, really, where do you think you made me a record sheet? <laughs> <laughs>
job drawings and put them up. That was her job. And the firm paid her to go around and help people archive and go through papers and say, look, I went through this, you know, the, the pat back in the office who says, don't touch everything, I know where everything is. Well, A, they don't. <laughs> B, you know, and this is a whole other presentation I have on the psychology of work. But what, what we do is sometimes people will actually hire someone to come in and sit and help them sort that stuff. Now, what they find when they do that, just like on the work, it's not about the stuff. 